All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 11th, 2023. And as you can see from today's title, we are going to spend some time in Scripture that a number of people have been asking me over the years. Many of you know that I've touched on it. Um, I've discussed it a little bit here and there. We, we generally have an idea of where it's going to be. But I'm going to devote half or most of today's video to that. We're not going to get there right away. We're going to start with some other stuff to encourage and strengthen and, and remind people of this season and time and these, these periods that we're looking at in this coming 30-day window or so uh, that we're in. A little, maybe a little bit more than 30-day window. And you all understand what I mean by that. Um, that's where we're going to start. Um, but you're going to see when we get into the bulls, it's very, very interesting. We're going to spend some time in the trumpets to compare them to the bowls, and we're going to see that the bowls are clearly not the trumpets. But what you're going to see is is really a it, it's a deduction because some people think, well, no, it relates to the end of the millennial reign for the bowls. Some people don't even know really how the bowls apply or or when they would apply, and the reason they don't is because. The seventh trumpet, it's, it is finished. So if it's finished at the seventh trumpet, where are the bowls? So we're going to cover these things. We're going to go through it. And I, I, I titled this the bowls. Um, you know, the, the scriptures tell us vials, but even though it says vials, I mean, all if you do, if you go to the description of the word, the description of the word means like a shallow bowl. All right. So vials are bowls, but you're going to hear me use the word bowls. And uh, that's going to be the, the, the main portion, if you will, or half of the videos we, uh, once we get to it. Um, but I really want to start with, with this season and time that we're in. So that's as we get going, that's where we're going to start. And for anybody that's new to the ministry, you guys know how I like to start it. We have a playlist right here. It's the Ministry Revealed playlist. This is the one right here called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. You can go to here on YouTube, or you can go to a place that will lead you into each one step by step to help you understand the revelation. So this is the Ministry Revealed website. This is the main page. The, the info is there. So is the, the intro video to everything. But the best place to go, our brother Jimmy, who does all of our websites uh, info and, and all of the website for us, um, put together this page for us. So this is... The intro, this intro series will guide you into the end time revelation hidden within the Gospels. Now, that's just the beginning. All right. It's the it, it's understanding who the Gospels that are speaking to that will lead you to the revelation of everything else. And it goes all the way back to the creation. So this video right here, this intro video is a 22 minute video that will give you the overview of the intro to the who the gospels are speaking to okay as you see right here who the gospels are speaking to it will then lead you into this so this is about a 30 minute video a bible study a 30 minute bible study right here and this is the revelation of the end times you're going to realize oh my goodness when you see who the gospels are speaking to and you realize that the synoptic gospels of matthew mark and luke and the first will be last and the last will be first become Luke, Mark and Matthew. You're going to say, oh, my goodness, then what does that do to the discourses? If, if the mysteries within the Gospels reveal different portions of time in the end of days, then does that mean the discourses are speaking to different portions of time within the tribulation? Absolutely. One hundred percent unequivocally. It is true. And you're going to understand as you go to this third video, which is the final one in the intro series, this one is about two hours and 45 minutes long, but I'm telling you, it is absolutely worth it because you're going to understand that because all of our foundation is found in the gospel or founded in the gospel of Matthew because we never really knew who Mark and Luke were speaking to, and they were just looked at as as add-ons information to events that took place what wasn't realized was their purpose in their mysteries of their discrepancies that the world calls them 
that reveal prophecy in the is to come. That is how powerful it is. You're going to realize that because everything we've been taught for hundreds of years is founded in the Gospel of Matthew, everything we have seen is only seven. We only see the tribulation being seven years. We only see the creation from in the beginning being 7,000 years. Well, this revelation that begins with who the Gospels are speaking to is going to blow your mind. You're going to see things in there like, um, and by the way, of course, you want to start with this one. This is going to lead you into what these other three are talking about. And it just, it does it in about 22 minutes. (laughs) Interesting number here in this ministry, if you understand. Um, But what you're going to see is things like in Luke's gospel, before Jesus goes to the cross, he's, he's given a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, he's arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. Well, what the heck? How did that happen, right? It's, it's when you realize what these differences are. You're going to see Jesus on the cross. His last words in Luke are, Father, into your arms, I commend my spirit. But in Mark and Matthew, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the word forsaken means leave behind. Jesus never thought he was being left behind. He knew he wasn't being left behind. Was it just a moment of weakness? No, it was prophecy. You see Luke saying, into your arms, I commend my spirit. And it's Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous, white, beautiful robe. Mark and Matthew are being left behind. Mark and Matthew are purple and scarlet, the two colors that are tribulation. This is what you're going to begin to understand, revealed in this intro series right here. And then from there, we've added to this. I had Jimmy add some other info. For people who then want to go deeper, you can go to the Ministry Revealed book that you saw on the home page. That'll link you in here as well to the book page. Um, yes, you can get paperback, but we also have uh, uh, from Amazon. But we also have PDF in five languages downloadable for free. We have an audio for free on the site. And you can actually read the book directly from the website if you didn't want to download anything. So it's all there. But... What you could also do, or on top of that, what you can do is come to these following videos. And these are all deep, detailed videos. They're all about, give or take, two to three hours long, somewhere in there. And this is one that we recently did, which is about the who the Gospels speak to, but way deeper, much further than that intro goes, and even further than many of the points in the books go, in the book goes. Then you can come to a fantastic one called the discourse is revealed you're going to see that luke's portion is a period of time of 40 to 50 days you're going to see mark's portion is the seven years of seals and matthew's is the seven years of trumpets you're going to say oh my goodness this guy's lost his mind no i promise you if you take the time if you it all begins if you take the time it all begins with that first intro to realize what these discrepancies what these why were these apparent contradictions why are they there in the gospels it cannot be explained by the church who says it was just perspective you see because they have nothing to do with perspective they have to do with the is to come of prophecy that's why ecclesiastes 1 9 tells us what was shall be and what is shall be that means the old testament from creation until christ the was it's going to be again And the is, which is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape, that's the is. Both of those that played out over thousands of years are going to play out in typologies over a short 14-year period, 14 years and change. Because you're going to realize this Luke portion is right before the 14 years begin, and it's only a short period of time of about 40, 50 days. I'm telling you, It's going to blow your mind. And when you understand these things and you begin to understand them in the Gospels, by the time you get to this breakdown in the discourses, you're not going to be able to unsee it. It's so fantastic. But it even goes deeper. It goes further because you're going to see that pre, mid, and post, things that have caused people to argue throughout generations. It's because every piece of, uh, it's because all three of them are revealed in Scripture. Everybody can point in scripture and say, pre, mid, and post. Here's a scripture for pre, here's scripture for mid, here's scripture for post. Well, they're all true. 
And people that have been telling you from Matthew, see the, the Lord coming in the clouds, or, which means on the clouds. That's actually post. So everybody that was looking at Matthew's discourse and pointing to that saying pre, they were wrong. They were actually thinking of mid, which is the end of Mark and leaves seven years for Matthew. But what they didn't realize is that conversation in, in Matthew's discourse is 100% post-trip. And the story plays out over 50 days and then 14 years. It's going to blow your mind. It's fantastic. Then you've got this one. This one goes through the seals and trumpets. This one goes through the tribulation. And it covers from uh, Revelation chapter 5 to about, I think it's uh, the first part of Revelation 14. It goes through the seals and the trumpets. And it's going to give you the understanding and break it down as you have never been able to see it and understand it before. It's truly that fantastic, but it could never be done without the revelation of the Gospels in 14 years. It's that powerful. I might even do an updated one of this because now we're going to even add to it with, <clears throat> even because since when this was done, I don't know, maybe a year, year and a half ago or something like that, there, we've got even greater detail. And as you're going to see today, when we get into the into the bowls, you're going to see that we can even stretch it and go all the way in to the end of the 14 years with the bowls as well. And it was a great recommendation by our sister, uh, Diane. So she she watches the videos and really digs deep. And uh, she had made a comment about that. To, you know, if we can do another just full meal deal of the tribulation and the events playing out. You, this is why it's been this is why there's been so many arguments and so many frustrations and so much division when it came to understanding prophecy. We never understood who the gospels were speaking to. How about this one? This one is the mystery of the seven churches. Okay, this is the end of day seven churches revealed. This is a mystery. I remember even Chuck Missler saying he would have loved to have understood it, but he never did. Right? It was never revealed. We have it here in this ministry. It's going to show you what I was talking about a moment ago. You're going to see that the, that the was and the is play out in the is to come. These things that played out over thousands of years that have typologies in the was as the seven churches, that have typologies in the seven churches of the is, of which we're at the tail end of Laodicea. By the end, of, in, in tribulation, it will start at the 50 days with Ephesus, and at the end of 14 years, it ends the time of Laodicea. You're even going to see that today as we get deeper into this, uh, to the end of bulls, you're going to see what I'm talking about when, when it's talking about the time frame of the end of Laodicea, which is, it's, it's one of the markers, it's one of the points that is even going to show us that it's connected, that the bulls are at the very end of the 14 years. This one is just a very interesting one. I call it the mystery of the comma ant. When you see what <laughs> something so simple is, like a comma with the word and, that alone will increase your understanding of, of tribulation and of revelation understanding. It's fantastic. This one is a mind blower. This one is called pro like the open books, prophecy on another level. And why is it important? Because you're going to see that the way the, the, the scriptures are laid out, is revealing in many books, I think like, I don't know, maybe a dozen different books we've revealed, or from 10 books in, in, in a dozen different ways, we've been able to show that there are chapters that equal years during the time of tribulation. At first, you're going to say, what is this guy talking about? Don't worry about it. Watch the other parts first. And when you get to this, you'll begin to understand what, what it means that these are connected in those years relating to chapters. And then there's the big one that brings it all back. The entire revelation, the story of the end of days is the story of the beginning of creation. It's that fantastic. And this one's called, it's a fractal. And what that means is the big overarching picture of creation is 21,000 years and the 22nd thousandth year is the beginning of eternity. It's going to blow your mind. It's absolutely fantastic. And again, you would not have been able to see it if you didn't first get the understanding of the 14 years and understand that there is a seven years that comes first. But that seventh year 
ends the final 70th, the final true 70th of Israel. That's how fantastic it is. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it there. Let you guys come and check this out. Gave you a good little overview of it all. We also have um, our, our brother Jimmy is, is working on another page. I was a little bit excited and I was hoping it would be done for today, but it's going to take a little bit more time. Hopefully by the next video, we're going to have another um, menu in here, another uh, a link, and it's going to be our mission. And our mission, as you guys know, it's, it's the mission of bringing about the revelation, sharing the understanding, preparing the bride and a worker bride, a remnant worker bride for the time to come. But it goes way beyond that, doesn't it? Those of you who are part of this ministry, you know that it also goes to Uganda and our brother Steve in Uganda. And he is doing all sorts of things and we're helping him, we're supporting him in absolutely everything we can to be able to provide Bibles, of which now is over 2,000 Bibles. We've provided, I believe now, just over 1,000 of the Ministry Revealed books that they print there in Uganda. They print there in Uganda, guys. It's that fantastic. They got a printer. There's a printer guy that they work with, and they're, they're giving out Bibles. They're preaching. They're going to churches. They're also sharing the revelation and preparing a people, preparing the bride, preparing more remnant workers for the is to come by teaching and revealing them the truth of the understanding of the is to come. He's feeding the poor. They're, they work, he's, him and his team, they're working with uh, medical companies to, to help those in need with physical ailments. They're, they're giving blankets. All sorts of these things are happening there. And if anybody wants to, as many as you have, and it's fantastic, there's always a need because Steve is busy, I would say probably five, six days a week, if not all of them, getting all of these things ready, traveling, going to the churches, going to pastors, teaching and preaching on these things. And they always need the supplies. And right now, everything is low. So you can go to GoFundMe, you can go to our PayPal, and you can always do it right here from the Ministry Revealed YouTube channel or in the link under this video in the description box. All right. With that, let's get started. And I'm going to first of all give a a little shout out to my wife. You see, we're the 11th right now. My wife's birthday, wouldn't you know it? My wife's birthday is Israel's Gregorian calendar birthday. May 14th is my wife's birthday. So a little shout out for my wife because my next video probably won't be till after her birthday. So thank you all for your well wishes for her. Now let's get started. Like I said, it's we're not going to... We're not going to begin with going into the bowls. I want to first give everybody the, the understanding. I'm going to show the, the, the positions, the three positions here through Ministry Revealed. The one, I believe it is, but I'm not going to discount the other two options as well because I'm going to show you their importance and why there are connections to them. Now, for anybody that's new, let me start it right here. Here we are, the 11th of May. And let me turn that off. We're the 11th of May, and there are three options. I believe the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks count is May 28th, and May 29th, the 9th of Savan, begins the 50 days. But there is also another option, which is June 4th, which is the 15th of Savan as the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks. And the 16th of Savan begins the 50-day count. But there's still also one more possibility, and that is the 14th of June or the 25th of Savan as the seventh Sabbath. You'll see why when we get to it. And the 50-day count beginning on June 15th, the 26th of Savan. You're going to understand when we get to it, but let me briefly explain for everybody. You see, when you go to the Feast of uh, First Fruits, the Feast of First Fruits, well, we know it was Resurrection Day for Christ, right? So we know the Jews from, from evening to evening, right? So it would have been 
from the evening of the 14th to the evening of the 16th, uh, sorry, of the 15th of Nisan, we see which is the 5th of June. So Christ was taken into the hands of sinful men after he had the Passover meal. He was taken, he was crucified on the 14th of, of Nisan. He was put in the grave before sunset because then it began the, pass, uh, uh, the weekly Sabbath, which is the 15th of Nisan, okay? He was in the grave for the 15th of Nisan, and he was in the grave till early in the morning on the 16th. Well, Christ is the Feast of First Fruits. This is the waving of the sheaf offering. So if you're going to count from the morrow after the Sabbath, you see, this is the Sabbath. The morrow after the Sabbath is right here, which means when you understand that it's the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th of every Hebrew month is the true Sabbath. How do we know it? Go read the Gospels, right? Passover, Christ was crucified. The 15th, the following day was the Sabbath. <clears throat> they always like to say, oh, high Sabbaths and everything else. No, it's because it was the Sabbath. You'll even find it all throughout Leviticus. We recently did a teaching on it, right? The 15th and then the 8th day, you see? Because why? They count this the first day. So they do it even with the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. So on the Feast of Tabernacles, it starts on the 15th. And what did he call the eighth day of Tabernacles? It said the first day of Tabernacles, which is the 15th, and the eighth day of Tabernacles, which is the 22nd. It said both of them were also um, Sabbaths. Luke 23, this is called the Sabbath. So we've understood this. We've talked about it for a while. So the Feast of Weeks says what? Seven Sabbaths. So count from the morrow after the Sabbath, from when you wave the sheaf offering, right? For the feast of uh the feast of first fruits. And what happens? One, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh, <clears throat> excuse me, is the eighth of Savan. This one makes the absolute most sense to me. And the reason it makes most sense is because we're just following it, just as it says in Leviticus. We're following it from the death and resurrection, the crucifixion and his, the resurrection of Christ. So this is the one that makes the most sense. Most people will say, oh, it's Pentecost. No, it's not Pentecost. Passover is seven Sabbaths, and from the morrow after, then you count 50 days. That's the truth of it. We've revealed it in many different ways, and, many, it was, and it was through the, the revelation of the end of days that we actually got the understanding of it. So how can we show that this is it? Well, one of them is we know that the 15th of Sivan is Jesus's birthday. Okay, we've been able to show this in many, many different places. But let me show you in Stellarium. So here's Stellarium. You see it's month one back, or sorry, sorry, not month one. It's 1 BC, the time of Jesus's birth. And it was June. And let's see, here we are going through the dates. Look at where the sun is in Gemini. Where is the sun in month one now? You see, everything is off by one month from where it was in Christ's time because the movement of the sun. In the beginning, it was another month further from there. So in Christ's time, here is month one in Gemini. And look at where he's born. See the moon going? We're going to follow the moon. And there's Venus and there's Jupiter. You follow it along. We're looking for what? We're looking for the star of Bethlehem. What do you think the chances are that the star of Bethlehem even happened on a full moon? You got it. Look at what happens. You see that Venus moving into Jupiter? And it became the brightest star in the sky. This is what they had seen. This has been proven by many people, lawyers, astrologers, uh, um, you know, the guy from the, the planetarium that we talked about, we shared not too long ago, Christ was born June 17th of 1 BC. And look at what it was, full moon. Do you know, check this out. If you go back one minute, I'm sorry, back one minute, it wasn't exactly full moon according to Stellarium. If you go forward one minute, it was 1635, right, military time, from Jerusalem, we're talking from Jerusalem, on June 17th, that it was full moon when Jupiter and Venus 
made the conjunction of the Star of Bethlehem. I just decided to go look that one up today and check this out. How cool is this? Watch this. So we're looking for 1635. Let's go to the Gregorian 1635. Watch this. Voluntary. Willingly. Isn't that awesome? It could have been any number, guys. It could have been any number, but the exact number of the full moon at the conjunction on June 17th of 1 BC is the word voluntary and willingly. Didn't Christ do exactly that? Didn't Christ say, send me, I'll go? Awesome, right? Right at the time of the conjunction. Now, what does this prove? Oh, you don't know that that really is. Okay, well, let's go have a look. Let's see in 1 BC, okay, this is the true 1 BC. To the Romans, right, to the Gregorian, they would say 2 BC because they don't include year zero. But in truth, it's 1 BC because we know there is a year zero. So let's go. There's June 17th. If we go right across, all you do is go right across to the same third row, and what do we get? Savan, the third month, 15th day. See, one, two, third row. June 17th is Savan 15. Now you might say, oh, that's it, that's it? You can't prove more than that? Ah, well, how about that? Let's prove a little bit more. Let's go to the book of Jubilees, and let me show you what else we've got. In the third month, okay, in the middle of the month, what's the middle of the month? 15th day. In the days which the Lord had said to Abraham on the festival of the first harvest, ah, feast of, first, uh, feast of weeks, right? Of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, Isaac was born. When was Isaac born? Third month, 15th day. Well, how about that? Let me show you another one. Isn't Jesus Right? Jesus is going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right? So as the lion of the tribe of Judah, do you think this is maybe fitting? And again, Jacob went in unto Leah, and she became, she became pregnant, and bore him a fourth son, and called his name Judah on the 15th day of the third, on the 15th of the third month. Isn't that awesome? So if he's the lion of the tribe of Judah and Judah is born on the 15th day of the third month <clears throat> and Isaac, who's called the promise, and Isaac is born on the 15th day of the third month and you go to the, you go to the star of Bethlehem and it was the 15th day of the third month, it's done. There's no more mystery. No more needing to, to go around seeking and searching when Jesus was born. We've understood it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So how does this apply? to this being the beginning of the 50 days, uh, sorry, sorry, the seventh Sabbath, and this being the beginning of the 50 days. Watch. In Isaiah chapter nine, again, I don't wanna to spend too much time in this, okay? In Isaiah chapter nine, we see that there was a light affliction that happened in two areas of Northern Israel, okay? We know it took place in Matthew four, it was fulfilled, so there was the Old Testament, Right? The was, the is, and there's going to be an is to come. We know that the 50 days before the 14 years begins with the light affliction in northern Israel. And this light affliction that starts will end shortly, right? Right at the time of the escape, there's going to be a, an attack in northern Israel. It's probably the whole Iran thing and everything else. <coughs> It'll be a short-lived war. And then, <coughs> excuse me. At the end of 50 days, we know Syria is coming and those who are with Syria and they will destroy Jerusalem and the Jews will be fled and the 14 years will begin. Well, look at what we get right here in Isaiah 9. Those that have been around for a while, you guys know it. But Isaiah 9 says there's a light affliction that comes first in the, in the two northern places, right? In Zebulun and Naphtali. And then what does it say? Then a light shines in the darkness for unto us a child is born. This is all about Christ. Is Christ coming as a baby? Did Christ, when he fulfilled it in Matthew 4, come as a baby? No. What's the clue here for us in the was to reveal the is to come? Well, we know there's a light affliction. Then the Lord comes on the eighth day. And then 
Syria comes and those with Syria to destroy them after. <clears throat> it's the revelation of the end of days that we've been sharing for a long time. We get the exact same storyline when we go to what we teach on, which is Luke in order. What does that mean, Luke in order? The Gospel of Luke has the first four chapters, which relate to pre, the 40 days of the Son of Man, mid, and post. That's the mystery hidden within Luke chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. And how does Luke chapter 1 start? With the birth of John the Baptist and then the eighth day of his circumcision. So the typology of the birth coming first is the typology of the bride escaping. The eighth day of his circumcision is then going to Luke chapter 2, and you go to Luke chapter 2, who's born? Jesus is born. What's the story of Jesus' birth? 40 days. So what do we get? We would be looking at the seventh Sabbath, and then what do you got? Then you have to the eighth day for John, right? John's birth time. And then to Jesus' birth, represented now as the 40 days about to begin. And it's important why? Because Isaiah literally lays out for us the exact same scenario. So I personally through many other things. Remember, this is just an overview and a reminder and get people, uh, uh, keep people on their toes watching and praying. I believe this is the seventh Sabbath, beginning of the 50 days, and it goes on from there. The Lord would come at the time of his birthday and the 40 days would begin. I believe we've proven enough evidence for it. But for anybody that's new, you're saying, well, how do you know this is the year? We're not gonna get into that. We've done a ton of videos on it. You must understand this is the end of the 70th year. The 70th year will end at the Feast of Weeks for the Lord God, the Father, beginning at the Feast of Weeks. And it is in Taurus. It all, it all stems from uh, Leviticus 23. But again, <clears throat> that's not the only part, is it? Because we have another option that has us kind of scratching our head a little bit. You see, because in Exodus 19, it says in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Uh, uh, and they pitched tents, right? Camped about. So third month, what day? Well, the same day that they left Egypt. They left Egypt on the 15th day of the first month. That means when they got there, it was the 15th day of the third month. What's the 15th day of the third month? This year is June 4th. Now, this wouldn't really seem to be too much, right? It really, it's maybe nothing much, except for the fact that the story in Exodus then goes on to describe a 50-day period of time that begins with the today, tomorrow, and the third day. Then the Lord is going to make himself known to them. He's going to give them the law. And then what happens? They freak out. They can't handle it. Then you have the story of seven days. They go to the mountain, and the seventh day, Moses goes up. Then he goes up for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, what do you got? You have a 50-day count that begins the 15th day, third month. So we know in this ministry that there's 50 days that come before the 14 years. And this one's telling us the third month, 15th day, being the same day as the day one is when they left. So I can't discount Jesus's birthday on the 15th of Sivan being the possibility of when the 50 days would begin, when the fifth feast of weeks when the Lord God is going to take out the bride, but it's connected to his birth. But you see where, the, where there's a bit of a dilemma, right? Because within this dilemma, we have Isaiah 9 talking about a light affliction, then the Son of Man's birth, and then the greater affliction, which has them removed from the land when Syria destroys them. 
it kind of it kind of throws a little wrench into that one. But when you go to Exodus 19 and you follow the story from there, well, you see it's starting here. Yet at the same time, it's his birth. Is it possible that he's actually going to begin everything on his birth? Of course it is. And I'm going to show you a little bit more connection to it, but what else does it do? Well, then it kind of seems to throw off the understanding of Luke in order. What would be the purpose of chapter one? Right? What would be the purpose of the, the seven days before the 40 in, in the story of the ark in Genesis 7? You see? Why would it be there and then it goes down to here? Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Is there even more, are there even more connections to it that, that, that could be very telling? There are. Because let me show you. This was shared the other day by our friend uh, Dennis in Florida and somebody else who had recently shared it in the forum as well. What do we have? The Six Day War. The Six Day War for Jerusalem was June 5th to June 10th. June 5th to do June 10th. And what is, if this is the seventh Sabbath at the time of the Lord's birth and this begins it, meaning this is the escape and this starts the 50 days, what date is it? June 5th. What happens on June 5th? A light affliction, this time in the northern part of Israel, and we know that it what? That it doesn't last very long pretty wild right is it kind of, it's going in reverse you see that remember just like matthew mark luke luke mark matthew we're seeing these things kind of play out in reverse in all these typologies <clears throat> so even though this was for jerusalem here's a short affliction with middle eastern nations against israel what are we looking for a light affliction in northern Israel with other Middle Eastern nations before the Son of Man comes to start his 40 days. What it doesn't line up with is it doesn't line up with connected from here and then him coming to start at his birth. Because this attack that we're talking about should start over here. Right? In this time frame here. But historically... And if we see this as a possibility as Exodus 19, well, guess what? There's the beginning of your 50 days. See, beginning of your 50 days, light affliction comes first. So where would it end? Well, if you went to Savan 8, right? And then you started counting your 50 days, you would end at Tammuz 28 which is July 17th. Now, in the big picture of things here, it, it, it doesn't seem very relevant, does it? There's nothing biblically that we can point to in this time frame with, with a real connection to attacks or historical evidence. And that's if we start from right here. So even though it has a count biblically and it has the seven to the eight days then his birth, what it's missing is something that would seem significant at the end for where an attack would be. You following me? Now, if we go to the June 15th, uh, uh, June 4th, as his birthday on the 15th of Savan, and the 16th, which would be the escape, and then the 16th of June, uh, uh, sorry, the 16th of Savan, or the 5th of June, and it's connected to the light affliction. And then the Lord would come again, as we know, after seven on the eighth day after the wedding week, just like we were doing here to here. Now we're doing it from here to here. What we don't have is the connection to his birth that makes any sense in relation to coming after the wedding. But you know what we do have as the 16th of Savant that begins the 50 days? Well, we've got a couple things, right? We know the 16th day in creation, which was in Taurus, and Savan is when the sun is in Taurus, and the 16th day of Savan was the beginning of creation called in the beginning. 
maybe this is the connection, right? But what about the 50 days counting from the 5th of June? Well, you got our light affliction. The Son of Man comes after seven on the eighth day. Where does the 50 days end? We'll check it out. The 50 days end on the 6th of Av. Now, why is that significant? Because this would be the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When the anointing of the Holy Ghost is done and they head out from Jerusalem, the disciples and the apostles that are going to be working, what's going to happen? Jerusalem is going to be attacked. And that would equal the seventh of Av. And everybody would say, but that's not the ninth of Av when Jerusalem was destroyed. No, but it starts on the seventh of Av. Are there any connections to that? Well, lo and behold, there are. Because the ninth of Av was when it was destroyed. But listen to this. According to the Bible, the first temple's destruction began, began on the seventh of Av. Began on the seventh of Av. The 50th day ends with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They go out from Jerusalem and the 14 years begin with an attack on Jerusalem. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom begins with the destruction of Jerusalem. And the attack began historically on the 7th of Av for what? Jerusalem. Where does this count begin? On June 5th, a Gregorian date for when they had the light affliction for Jerusalem. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I can't discount this. There's connections there, but I clearly can't discount this because the seven days goes before his birth. Well, it still goes a little further. Let me show you this one. Remember Psalms 19, and this is why I don't want to dis discount this one either. Because in Psalms 19, it's all about the sun, moon, and stars. Psalms 19, we know here in this ministry, when I was sharing a little bit ago about the, um, the chapters to years in the, in the video of the intros, this is the chart for the chapters to years. These are all the books that we've opened and shown the events that relate within the chapters that give us insight into events that will take place during the end of days. And that's what we've got here. Psalms 18 into Psalms 19. Psalms 18 is that week. Then you've got the 40 days of the Son of Man starting. And what does that equal? What does that show us in Psalms 19? It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Why? Because it's the sun, moon, and stars, right? Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he hath set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. When does a bridegroom come out of his chamber? After he's been with his bride, the seven-day wedding. And he's coming out rejoicing as a strong man ready to run his race. When is he ready to run a race? After his wedding, when he comes back to start the eighth day, right? At the, at the eighth day, which then becomes what? He comes at the eighth day and the 40 days of the Son of Man begins. What does it tell us about this time? It says his going forth is from one end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends thereof. <clears throat> so it's relating to him as the sun. So what is the circuit of the sun? Let's go to that piece of scripture real quick. You guys know it. I want these three points to be nailed into your mind so you guys understand these are the three periods that we're ever going to look at in relation to escaping for through this ministry with me anyways. This word for circuit of the sun, you guys know it. Okay, it relates to the year's end. Now, the year's end has several meanings. Well, it has two meanings, but two specific, meaning one is the course of the sun. And the other one is a lapse of time. Now, the lapse of time could be many things. The lapse of time could be from trumpets to trumpets, right? A year. It could go Nissan to Nissan. 
He can go to the, the time of tabernacles, the end of tabernacles, where the Lord begins at the feast of, uh, of Passover and he ends his feasts in tabernacles. So you have years, you have year portions and different times where year starts and where year ends. You've got the new year of trees. Okay, so you've got a start and an end of a year there. So that's what relates to a lapse of time. But the other one relating to the sun is the course of the sun, a circuit or a revolution of the sun, which leads to believe the connection to the summer solstice. Remember, the father says what? Summer and winter. He doesn't have, he doesn't have spring, he doesn't have fall. Everything is summer and winter to the father. So you would say, well, okay, well, if Jesus is born here, what does this have the connection to do with over here at the time of, of the solstice? Well, remember, what would this be connected to? This would be the time of him coming out what? After the wedding, coming out of his bridal chamber as a strong man ready to run a race to start his 40 days, which begins what? On the eighth day. Which means this would be the equivalent of what we were saying here. So either this is the seventh Sabbath, this is the seventh Sabbath, or this is the seventh Sabbath. Now there's a problem there, isn't there? Because what does the 8th, 15th, 22nd, 29th have to do with the 25th? Well, for starters, eight days later, him coming out at the circuit of the sun as a strong man ready to run a race, we can't discredit that. But if it starts over here from over here, that being the seventh Sabbath, how many days do we have in between? We have 10 days. We have 10 days. Okay? What happens with those 10 days? Well, glad you asked. Because let's go look at this in the book of Jubilees. In the book of Jubilees, it says, and there will be those who will make observations of the moon, for this one, the moon, corrupts the stated times and comes out early each year by 10 days. Now, you guys are going to say, oh, Alan, we covered that before. I, think, I didn't think we had to worry about that anymore or concern ourselves with it anymore. I don't believe we do. However, we have scripture of him coming out at the circuit of the sun as a bridegroom ready to run a race, having come out of his chamber. You see? Which means the eight days earlier is exactly what? Ten days off. Which would mean what? When the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days, he's beginning in the month of Tammuz? You see, it would no longer be in Taurus. Oh, everything still started in Taurus. You notice, everything still begins in Taurus regardless. Hello. That's the point. It all begins in Taurus. The moon has been accounted for. We know it's Taurus that begins it all. We know it's true Feast of Weeks, whichever one it is. But why would the Lord be coming in the month of Tammuz? Let me show you what the possibility is. What do we know about the Gospel of John? We know from the Gospel of John, it starts the 50 days in John chapter 20, it goes into Luke 24, the 40 days, right? Start at the eighth day, goes into, goes into uh, Luke 24, and then goes into Acts 1 and 2, and it ends the 50 days at the Holy Ghost. We've covered this many times. So what happens? The escape happens. We know he's going to meet with the disciples first. Then the escape is going to happen. He's gone to the wedding, right? After he what? After he breathes the Holy Ghost on the apostles that he's chosen. And now he's gone for the wedding. He returns from the wedding what? Again, after eight days, he comes back from the wedding. When he comes back from the wedding, he's going to meet briefly with the, with the apostles, then with the disciples. They're going to follow him for 40 days, right? Where does it begin? 
<coughs> the eighth day. That's exactly what we're saying, right? It's going to begin the eighth day. But the eighth day would suddenly be in Tammuz. So what's the point? Well, have you ever found it interesting that in John chapter 20 is the place you find the word Thomas more than ever? In six verses, you find Thomas's name one, two, three, four, five times. And they all surround when the Lord comes on the eighth day. Uh, okay. What does that matter, right? Big deal. Well, let's have a look. What does Thomas's name mean? <coughs> Excuse me. His name means twin. What does the month of Tammuz mean? The month of Tammuz is Gemini. When the sun and the moon, right at new moon, are in Gemini, and Gemini has begun. What, is, what does Gemini mean? Represents the twins, right? Represents the twins. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go see. As it representing the twins, <clears throat> let's go into 2023 and see what happens. Let's go forward in time. Oops, let's go back in the hours. And let's see. There it is. Okay, now Taurus is ending. There's the sun with the new moon. And you can't see it, but it is 1.7% <clears throat> illuminated. So chances are at the setting of the sun, they're going to see the crescent of the moon. Okay. The Hebrew calendar has it a little bit earlier. Let me show you the Hebrew calendar. The Hebrew calendar, well, right about the same time, actually. See, the first of Tammuz. So you've got the first of Tammuz, which is Gemini. What is Gemini? Castor and Pollux. Look at what happens. There it is. The sun, 21st into the 22nd, Gemini has started, which is the twin. When is it beginning? In Tammuz, on the eighth day. Do you see what I'm getting at? There's no way I could dismiss any of these. But I would sure hope that we are all watching for, excuse me, for the 28th of May. To me, that is the most clear understanding. We've shown it from Revel uh, Genesis chapter 7 with the seventh day and after seventh day. We showed it with Isaiah. We showed it with Luke in order that we've understood for like four years. I do believe this is the proper count. That May 28th, the 8th of Savan, is the true seventh Sabbath. But I can't dismiss that June 4th, the 15th of Savan, is also another possibility because the 50 days begins with a what is, right, in the current, we're still living in the is, started with an attack. And when this attack ended, or, or when this 50 days comes to an end, it actually begins the 14 years when the first attack, when the attack on Jerusalem now begins the 14 years. I, I, how can I deny that? I can't just dismiss it either. But then we've also got a piece of scripture talking about him coming at the circuit of the sun, the 21st and the 22nd of June, right? Talking Jerusalem time at the summer solstice of which the father said summer and winter all throughout scripture which would line up as jesus being born right or or the connection to him being born if you will or his time of his circumcision being connected to the circuit of the sun just like john the baptist would be at the winter solstice and we've got apocrypha telling us about 10 days for the moon. I can't deny it. So what are we looking at? The 28th of June, uh, sorry, the 28th of May, the 4th of June to the 14th of June. That is our window. 
Hopefully, we won't have to worry about any of them <laughs> past May 28. All right? We have understood it, brothers and sisters. This is the 70th. It is at hand. The digital currencies are being released. We see all of the increased attacks coming against Israel. We see Iran now. Iran has the nukes. We believe they've had them for a long time. And now everything is heating up, heating up, heating up. What's coming? The short attack comes first. Will it be the escape and start on the 29th? Or will it be the escape on June 4th and begin on June 5th and history repeating itself? So what would we have? We would have a June 5th in the is. And then we would have a July 25th, 7th of Av in the was. Pretty crazy, right? Didn't I say in reverse? Pretty wild stuff, guys. We are here. I hope it's the sooner rather than later. But brothers and sisters, we're here and it's exciting. So let me get going here now into the bowls. When we get into the bowl judgments, um, what I want to do is I also want to, sorry, give me a second here. What I'm also going to do is we're going to talk on trumpets as well. Okay, because we want to see these comparisons within trumpets. So um, our brother Charlie had shared, you know, the, these, these extreme similarities within the trumpet judgments to the bowl judgments. But we're going to show what those differences are, because as much as there are similarities, there are very clear differences still at the same time. And then um, see where the bowls can't be later and where they can't be earlier, which really focuses us in in one area. So I know a lot of people have been asking me about this as well. So I thought it would be a good time to, to get into it. Since Charlie had sent that to me, since uh, others had posted under videos, you know, they always say, what about the bulls? What about the bulls? And, you know, one of the simplest things uh, when it comes to the bulls is it's, it, it, it's after that time of the seventh trumpet, right? The seventh trumpet happens, the Lord has returned feet down, and then the bulls come out. So when we see that it is finished at the voice of the seventh trumpet, it is finished. It is finished because the Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. But there still is judgment coming in, in that end time frame in that 14th year. There's destruction coming for all of those who came against. And in God's mercy, you see, a lot of people forget. A lot of people don't understand that the Father, the tribulation is the Lord's mercy. It seems crazy, doesn't it? It seems like an absolute contradiction of all contradictions, but it's not. If he never brings it about and life continued on the way it was forever and ever, there would be nobody left to save. There would, there would be no point in any of it. It has to come to an end. And we know from the creation of the flesh and the fall, to, the, to Christ's death and resurrection, to his return, it's going to be after 2,000 years, right? And the total will be 6,000 from the flesh, not the other two creations. You'll get that if you've been watching the other stuff, okay? And how do we know? Well, because the final one is the millennial reign. The millennial reign is what? The seventh Sabbath, the 7,000th year Sabbath. The world will tell you it's the 7,000th year. The truth is it's the, it's the 21,000th year. But the first seven flew by. They were easy. And just like the tribulation is 14 years, the final two sevens, it's those two that were the main ones that are seen. The days of creation that are thousands to the Lord and the thousands of the flesh that relate to days to the Lord. The final 14. What is the final seventh? It's the final millennial reign. It's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. So check this out. 
this was a, a little interesting. I want to share this with you guys right off the bat. Another, this was a sister shared this with me or, or shared asking me about it um, probably a couple, three months ago about maybe even longer, actually, looking into lightnings, thunders, and voices. And I haven't spent much time, and I'm not spending much time here, except to just show you something that I thought was interesting. Look at where they are. The lightnings, thunders, and voices, okay? It's found in three scriptures. Three, uh, uh, sorry, um, not three. It's found in four verses in the book of Revelation where you have all three of them together. And what do you get? Revelation 14, 5. Well, isn't that interesting? Because when it says, you know, and John was, it was told, come up hither, this is the, this is the time of the pre-trip at Revelation 4, 5. And you have lightnings, thunders, and voices. I thought that was interesting. And why did I think it was interesting? Because when you get to Revelation 8, 5, which is the seventh seal time frame, you have voices, thunders, thunderings, and lightnings. So you have the end of one period of time, the pre-trib escape, bang. And then you've got voices, thunderings, and lightnings. Then you get to Revelation, the end of seals, the rapture of the multitude has come. And then you get what? Voices, thunderings, and lightnings. Revelation eleven nineteen is what? You guessed it. It's the seventh trumpet. It's the seventh trumpet. And at the seventh trumpet, what do you get? Lightnings, voices, and thunderings. <laughs> You're seeing a pattern, right? So you have it at the time right after the pre, after the mid, and after the post. And then what do you have? Revelation 16. At the end of the bowls. Voices, thunders, and lightnings. I thought that was pretty cool because it's showing the end portion of each period of time. You see, when the bulls, when, uh, sorry, when the seventh trumpet sounds, it tells us in Revelation 10, let's go to Revelation. It tells us in Revelation 10 that when the seventh trumpet, verse seven, Revelation 10, verse seven, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Why? Because the Lord's returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives. This is the same thing we read over in Daniel <coughs> chapter 12. This isn't, by the way, that seventh trumpet, when it sounds, it's not the end of 14 years. It's the end of 13 years. The, seventh, uh, the final 14th year, the seventh year of trumpets still has to play out. And this is what we read here. You know, when in Daniel 12, verse 7, uh, the one who still many waters, right hand and his left hand up to heaven, swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for time, times, and a half. Remember I was saying in the intro, there's the, the word about having a comma and the word and? Well, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, between time and times, there's no and. There's only a comma, which means one, two, comma, and means plus a half. That means two and a half years. So Satan's time, and, and when the Antichrist is brought back, and Satan's time, and the false prophet, how long is this period going to last? This is two and a half years. This is the final two and a half years of the second half of trumpets, which brings you to about the final 14th year. It will bring you to the end of 13 years of tribulation, which leaves the final seventh year of trumpets. This is why you get till I've scattered the people. And it says, and I scatter the holy people. All these things shall be finished. But we know it's not finished. There's still one more year. So something intense is going to be seriously taking place in that time. How do we know? Because Satan will be here. False prophet is going to be here. And Antichrist, remember, who is brought back from the, from the bottomless pit at mid-trumpets, is going to be here. All three of them are going to be there. 
But you, remember, for, for those who might be newer, when you go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, when he's going to scatter them, right? Chase them with water and scatter all the people. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, when Satan is cast down, it says that they're going to fly away on the wings of an eagle for time and times and half a time. That means what? One plus two plus a half. That's a total of three and a half years. Which means those who fly away on the wings of an eagle, they're not coming back at the end of the 13 years. They're not coming back till the 14th year of tribulation is done. Which means something more is taking place in that final 14th year. Yet it's finished after 13 at the start of the 14th because the whole world will have seen the Lord coming as what? Lightning from one end unto the other. It is finished. The mystery of God is over. So what is this final year? If it's finished at the beginning of the sound of the seventh trumpet and there's still one more year to go, what can we discern happens during that final year? Well, here's a clue for us right off the bat. My coffee, it doesn't matter what time of night. <laughs> All right. You see, it brings us back to our favorite Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. We've covered it a million times here in this ministry. We've understood it. And in the last video, we brought even more revelation to understanding it. Okay. This is the 70 weeks, the 70 feasts of weeks to the Father that will be done at this year's true Feast of Weeks, whether it's the 8th, the 15th, or the 25th, either case, it's going to be the end. And I believe it with all of my heart. We have understood the 70 years of Israel. And for those that are new, we'll be sharing this again in, in other times. But we have shown it right here. When you get the count understood from when they came into the land of Israel with Leviticus and you understand it, and when the 70 years truly began for them, it will end at the Feast of Weeks. Remember I said those first easy seven years will be the end of the 70th from when they came into the land and planted and then when it became theirs? Well, it also turns out that from 1967, when they got it in, in June of 1967, and then in June of 1968, completed year one for when they got Jerusalem, it turns out... <clears throat> That when the 14th year ends, the 70th year of Jerusalem ends. So you've got one for the 70 years of Israel, and there's directly divided by 14 years to the end of 70 for Jerusalem. I do not believe at all that there is any possibility that we're going at any other time. We are looking late May to middish June, and it will be in the month of Sivan. No questions asked. Absolutely. Oh, you can ask me questions, but <clears throat> to me, it's a done deal. I don't know if you guys can feel it, but the pressure, I don't know, man, like my shoulder, my shoulder's been killing me for just over two weeks, my right shoulder. I got some medicated patches to put on it every day uh, for a few days, and it is feeling better. But then I'm feeling it in, 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 my, in my thoughts, and I just feel, uh, and I feel... I need energy to get picked up and, you know, it, it, it's knowing how close we are. It's, it's knowing what's at hand. My wife is feeling it with her work and everything building. She just can't handle it. But I keep saying, just hold on a little longer. You know, I'm hearing it from so many of you and the struggles and the trials. They're just increasing. We've seen videos of people saying that, that because the enemy knows his time is at hand, the, the pressure on those that belong to the Lord is just massing. You know, I don't want to speak these things in. I'm just telling you, I myself can feel it more than I ever have before. But I'll tell you one thing. Even when I don't feel like doing a video, I am always doing one. And why? I will continue to do it because it's what gives me the greatest joy. It gives me the absolute greatest joy. Because I think what a lot of people, not I shouldn't say, not, definitely not most in the ministry, but when you understand what has been and is being revealed here for the past five and a half years, 
How could anybody walk away? These are mysteries we were told hidden from the beginning of creation. Being revealed through this ministry. I'm just a mouthpiece. You've heard me say that a hundred times. I am just a mouthpiece. As I learn it, as I grow in it, as it's revealed in understanding, as I seek it out, I share it with you. And you guys go and seek it out for yourselves, whether it be true or not. And when you do, those that do, it's changed your lives as it has me. You dig deeper. You are spending more time in Scripture. You're more excited because as you read, you can understand more than you ever have. How can it ever be dismissed and walked away from? Dates might come and go, but his word is true and it is going to happen. Pre, mid, and post are all true. The 14 years and the above with the 50 days, it's all true. Who the gospels are speaking to, it is absolutely revealed. It's all true. I love it. This is what brings me the joy in sharing it with you guys. And I'm so glad we've got the forum there at Ministry Revealed where we can all come together from all over the world. I love it. I love you guys so much. So what are we talking about here with Daniel 9.24? Got a little bit sidetracked. <laughs> so it's when we come to verse Daniel 9, verse 27. You see, the world has told you because they only understand seven years, they've told you that Daniel 9.27 is the final seven years of tribulation. It's not. You see, it's called what? A week? You've got seven weeks here. You've got a, a mention of two weeks. When the cutoff happens, we know this right here, when, when Messiah is cut off, this piece right here is the Revelation 12, 4, time, times, and a half. It's the two and a half years that Satan gets. And it leaves what? One year. One year represented in the weeks like Feast of Weeks, right? So remember, the Father's counting from Feast of Weeks, but it will begin the 14 years at True Pentecost, at that second attack. But to the Father, it's still always at Feast of Weeks. <clears throat> so again, this is why we say, you know, we don't know the exact start date, the exact end date, the exact everything uh, of every piece throughout, but we're within, you know, a few weeks, uh, a couple months on either side. Throughout the entirety of tribulation, from beginning to end. So, look at what you're seeing here. This right here, when Messiah is cut off, the people of the prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. What flood? He's going after them in Revelation 12, 14 with a flood. And then unto the end of the war, which means there's a war that's going to end. What is the end of that war? It's when he makes war against the two witnesses. That war against the two witnesses is going to last two and a half years. How do we know? Because it starts at the opening of the pit. It starts when Satan is cast down. It goes after Judah with a flood. They fly away on the wings of an eagle. And the two and a half years begin, which is the war, which is why you don't see the two witnesses killed until the end of the sixth trumpet which equals the time of the end of the sixth year of trumpets. Not because each trumpet is a year, not because each seal is a year, but the end of six years of trumpets is at the end of the second woe, which is the sixth trumpet. That's when that war ends. What, what then happens? At the end of this right here, it's what we just read in, in Revelation chapter 10, it is finished. At the beginning of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. When you go to what we just read in, Revel in Daniel 12, 5, uh, 12, 4. Right? At the sound uh, uh, um, that he has time, times, and a half. And what? To have scattered the people and then what? It is finished. This is it right here. At the end of Daniel 9, 26. At the end of that verse, Satan's two and a half year reign in the, in the portion of the second half of trumpets comes to an end. What happens at that point? The Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives for that final year, which is why, for those who might be newer, when you get to Zechariah, you see 14 chapters, it represents 14 years. It starts with the 70th year, and it ends with what? 
the Lord returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives. What's he going to do? He's going to fight against them as he did in the day of battle, which is as the fight he had against them at the end of seals is now the battle in the end of trumpets, in that seventh year of trumpets. This is what's going to take place in that seventh year of trumpets. You get information about it in here. Talking about all nations and gathering them together and destruction coming, <clears throat> right? The wine press and everything else. So when you go back to Daniel 9 and you go to verse 27, you see this? We haven't even gotten into the bowls yet. Look what happens. Uh, in what it says in verse 27. And he, this is Jesus, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay, for one year. And in the midst, now, for many, they say, well, what do you mean confirm the covenant for one week? <coughs> this is Jesus. This is him returning as lightning, feet down on the Mount of Olives. What covenant is he confirming? He's confirming the covenant that he made at the very end of seals to the beginning of trumpets. This is why in Zechariah 11, where you see that Messiah is cut off just like here, it says that he breaks his covenant that he made with all people. Why did he break it? Because Satan was cast down. Satan's getting his two and a half years to scatter the people and go after them, war and everything else. With the Antichrist there, with the false prophet there. So what happens when the Lord comes and returns feet down in the Mount of Olives. He's going to confirm that covenant that he had broke. He's now going to confirm the covenant back again because now he's taking everything unto himself. Listen to what it says now. Here, here's, this is a part that has really confused me when, when listening to others that, that teach on seven years. I never, ever understood this. It says, and in the midst of the week, so in the, in the midst of that year, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. If this was the Antichrist, isn't it the Antichrist that causes the sacrifices and the oblations to take place? And, see, so he's going to, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease, comma, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. What's he going to do? He's going to destroy it. Isn't it the Antichrist who caused the sacrifice and the oblations that Jesus is going to cause to cease? And is it the Antichrist who what? Who caused the overspreading of abominations? You notice how it's plural? Because there's one in Mark and there's one in Matthew. So how is he supposed to be the Antichrist who's going to put an end to sacrifice and oblations when we're told it's the Antichrist who's going to be killing everybody, and it's the Antichrist that's causing the abominations. The he is Messiah, and he shall confirm the covenant for many for one week, which is the 14th year. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it destroyed. Why on earth would the Antichrist make a covenant to stop his own abominations when he's the one doing the abominations that cause desolation? Never made any sense to me. But when you don't have the understanding, we just nod our head. We nod our head and we say, uh, uh, all right, I, I don't get it. You know more than me, I guess. It never made sense. Well, now, listen to what it says. It said in the midst of it. So sometime within that final year, he's going to cause these things and overspreading of abominations, he's going to make it desolate. And listen to what he says next. Even until the consummation, okay? Even until the completion. See that? Meaning it's, it's not all completed yet, but even until the completion, comma, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. What do you pour upon the desolate? Who are the desolate? The ones that will be destroyed. 
the ones that were left without, the ones who took the mark. What's he going to do? He's going to pour it out on them, to flow forth, to liquefy, to drop, to pour forth, to pour out. Get the hint? It would appear that the bowl judgments come at the later portion of the seventh year of, uh, sorry, at the end, towards the end of the 14th year of trumpets. In the later portion of that 14th year, the bowls are poured out. How can we know this, guys? Because the story is 14 years. The story is the 14 years. Yes, there's the 7,000 or the easy seven and so forth. But the overall all arching story is the light group and the flesh. The creation of days that would be to us as a thousand, but they were days with the Lord. And the creation of flesh, which is the portion of the flesh that we're living in, which is the thousands that will be to the Lord as day, to the Father as days. Days as thousands, thousands as days. To us, they would both be portions of thousands. To the Lord, they would both, Father, they would both be portions as days. It doesn't go beyond. You see? It doesn't go beyond 14 years. After the 14th year is over, it's the Jubilee. How are you going to have bold judgments during the Jubilee? The answer is you're not. When, when the typology of the millennial reign, which is what? The millennial reign will represent the final 14,000th year or the big picture 21, but in the, in the days to thousands, the thousands to days of the light group and the flesh group, that 14,000th year is the millennial reign. You see? There, after the millennial reign, it's the new beginning. It's the new creation, new heavens, new earth. So what happens after the 14 years? It's the jubilee. It's the new beginning. When does that start in the big picture? It's the beginning of the millennial reign at the jubilee. So how, when everything gets renewed, how, right? It gets repaired. It gets renewed. How are we supposed to have the bold judgments after that? We don't. What about the bold judgments at the end of the millennial reign? Can't be. And I'm going to prove you those things. You see, in fact, let me go to this right off the bat with you. You see, in Ezekiel, we know in Ezekiel, starting in chapter 47, <coughs> we see that the waters that flow out from the threshold, right? That flow out from the throne, from the, the temple when the Lord comes. What do the waters do? They spread out, they go out, and they renew the earth. You see? They're going to renew everything. So, watch this. When you go to uh, verse uh, chapter 48 of Ezekiel, what happens? All the tribes receive their land. They all have their portion of land. What is the promise to the Jews? Right? What is the promise to Israel? That they would each receive their portion, right? What is their promise? Their promise, remember? Let's go to this. Uh, where is it? Genesis 21. See, chapter 21, 14th year. Seven easy, seven of seals, seven of trumpets. And what is it? The birth of Isaac. A typology of Christ. Everybody knows it. And what was Isaac called? The promise. Here he is. The promise coming. At the 14th year. When, Isaac is, when Abraham is 100. It all started when he was 86. And when he's 100, it's over. It's the 14th year. Why do, I, why do I show this with Isaac? <coughs> because it's their promise. When Christ returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, destroys the enemies, and they get brought back at the end of the 14th year. What is it? <coughs> Excuse me. 
It's the final jubilee. What do they get for the final jubilee? Leviticus 25, verse 8. Thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven, da, 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 cause it be. Uh, and thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound. Verse 10. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty, liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession. You shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You see, if we go to the chapters to years, check it out. <clears throat> Ezekiel is one of those books that is open. Look at this. Starts in the 14th year. Okay, 14th year. Towards the end of it, everything gets renewed. And then what do you see at the end of chapter 47? It starts with Joseph getting the double portion for his sons. And then what? Every tribe getting his land. Remember what happened as I was explaining earlier. With three and a half years left of trumpets and Satan is cast down at about this point, Satan's time is two and a half years until the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the start of the 14th year, at the sound of the beginning of the, 14th, uh, of the seventh trumpet. But those who flew on the wings of an eagle, they don't return until after three and a half years, which means they're not going to return until the end of the 14th year. <clears throat> And what do you see in Ezekiel 48? That's right. You see them each getting their land. What does it equal? The final jubilee. See, this side is the big picture. And this is the tribulation portion. This is the big picture. Everything's in order. <coughs> Excuse me. No oh, coffee. You see? So everything is there. Oh, you know what? Let me shut down Stellarium now that we've completed that. All right. So we can see this with the 50th. Well, let me show you what else we can see. If we go to Revelation 20. So <clears throat> this was to show you on one side that we see when the tribulation comes to an end, we know what? That the water is going to flow from the temple in Jerusalem, when the Lord takes his throne and everything else, we know that the water is going to flow from there. Sorry, one second. Yeah. We know that the water is going to continue to flow from there, and it's going to renew everything. Watch this. If we go back into Zechariah 14, you're going to see the same conversation take place. Uh, da, 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 shall be over all the earth. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Come and worship the king. The altar of the Lord. Where is it? Here, give me a second. I'm sure I've got it in these notes here somewhere. I think I have it highlighted. There you go. Verse 8. So in Zechariah 14, verse 8, it says, and it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea in summer and in winter. There you go, summer and winter, you see? Shall it be. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. See that? That's when the living waters go out. When the living waters go out and it renews all the land and everything else, what happens? Brings them back into the land. Then he's king over all. And even though he's king over all, look what happens. In Zechariah, now there's destruction coming. These guys are going to be consumed on their feet and so forth, right? Look, even Judah shall fight at Jerusalem, as we read throughout Zechariah 14, verse 14. It's all there. So this is this is in the 14th final year. This is taking place. Well, let's go to the other end of the spectrum, because this led us <coughs> and showed the, these events happening before to the end of the 14th year. And we saw in Daniel now when the bold judgments are going to be poured out at some point late in the 14th year. Well, if we go to Revelation chapter 20, 
we see in Revelation chapter 20, uh, the angel that came with the key to the bottomless pit, and what happens? Satan. Satan's called what? In Revelation 20, verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan. Okay, so we know the dragon is also Satan. And cast him into the bottomless pit. So now what's happened? That he should deceive the nations no more <coughs> until the thousand years are finished. So we see Satan is now bound for the thousand years. When Satan is, is loosed, okay, we've got the events. <laughs> we don't get much of what takes place during the thousand years here, right? You just get a little blurb. Uh, the first resurrection, right? Those who worked for him during seals, right? They'll rule and reign with them. But when the thousand years are done and Satan is loosed, you have, the Gog, you have the battle of Gog and Magog this time, not just Gog as you read over in, in uh, 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 Ezekiel chapter 39. That's the end of seals, just Gog, right? This is Gog with Magog. And listen to what it says. Uh, starting in verse 9. And they went up upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Listen to this. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. <laughs> and God came out of heaven, right? And fire, sorry, the beloved city and fire came down from God. This is from the Father out of heaven and devoured them. How do you know this is God the Father? Because the Son was here on the earth. He's here during the millennial reign. He's ruling and reigning. When the thousand years are over, the Father says, he lets them all be gathered, right? They all come and gather about all as the sands of the earth come to gather to destroy. And what does he do? Sends fire to devour them from heaven. Do you hear any bold judgments? Nope. Listen to what it says next in Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Listen to this where the beast and the false prophet are. And from that point on, they're tormented forever and ever, right? So what happens? The beast and the false prophet are already there. So it can't be that the bold judgments are maybe at the end of the millennial reign. There's no judgments here. The Lord allows them to gather and then boom, destroys them all. Fire from heaven and then Satan is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are. So the question is, when did the beast and false prophet end up in the lake of fire? For that, we go to Revelation 19. We go back one. And we see, starting in verse 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, uh, a white horse and he that sat on him is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. Isn't that interesting? Didn't we read that in, in Zechariah 14? He has to come and what? Make war. He has to bring the second sword, right? That second destruction. The first one is at the end of seals. The second one is at the end of trumpets. The first one is the Gog and Magog war at the end of seals. And what do we know about that, that, that Gog war? Not Gog and Magog, but that Gog war in Ezekiel 39. We know that that's the time when Antichrist is going to be killed. Remember, he's here during seals, right? The, and he gets his power to continue at about the midpoint of seals-ish, right? Approximately mid-seals. He's going to have 42 months to continue, right? Satan's going to give him his power and his seat and his authority to continue 42 months. But we know at the end of seals, he's going to get killed. <clears throat> and people say, well, 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 if he's killed at the end of seals, how is he coming back at the end of trumpets? Because when Satan's cast down and the pit is open, the Antichrist is coming back. We've proven that in many ways, but let me help some new people with that. You see in uh, Revelation chapter 17, start uh, in verse 8. The beast that thou saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Hello. Was, is not, and shall. The was was the 42 months that he had in the second half of seals before the Lord came on 
heavenly Mount Zion, and Jesus the Lamb, his wrath then began. That was the destruction of the Ezekiel 39 war. And Antichrist is killed. That's the story that you read, as we've shared many times over in Daniel chapter 7. Right? The Ancient of Days did come, and then you see uh, uh, that the, the beast, right, was killed. But the other, right, the, other, the others uh, had their dominions taken away, but their lives were still extended. The false prophet wasn't killed. Only the Antichrist was, and of course, however many millions died coming into the battle. But the, only the main leader of the Antichrist was the one killed. So when trumpets begins, and the Lord is here ruling and reigning, right, and the city and the streets are being rebuilt, and the temple being built, <coughs> the beast is not. But then what happens? Satan's cast down. The pit is opened. It's the, it's the, it's the, fifth, it's the fifth trumpet. The pit is opened. And what's going to happen? He's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. This is why, <clears throat> and I'm sharing this on purpose. <clears throat> this is why when you get, <clears throat> excuse me, try. This is why when you get to Revelation chapter 19 and you see the son of man coming, right? The white horse rider, and he's about to make war and judge with them. Look what happens. Da, 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 da. It says, uh, starting in verse 14, and the armies which are in heaven was with them clean and white. Verse 15, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. This is the second battle. This is the one, like I said a moment ago, from Zechariah 14. It says, as when he fought. So we know it's the fought. He fought against them already at the end of seals time. At the end of six years seals. We know from Daniel 7 that he was, Antichrist is killed. and now he's got one more sword. That's why he was given two swords, right? And the whole story of it. So what do we see here? Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. You see, at the end of the sixth year of seals, when you go to Revelation 6, let's go to it real quick. This is when the Lord's coming to fight the Ezekiel 39 war. <clears throat> Whose wrath is it? It's the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of the Lamb's wrath. When you come to Revelation 19, which again is relating to the 14th year of tribulation, right, that final year of trumpets, you see that now he's coming. Uh, he, he'll tread it, the winepress of the fierceness, and the wrath of Almighty God. Okay, he has on his vesture. Let's keep going. Revelation 19, verse 19 and 20. And it says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So when do we see the beast and the false prophet being thrown into the lake of fire? In the 14th year of tribulation. So in the 14th year, in the final battle, at the second sword, at the treading of the winepress, at that great battle, Antichrist and false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. But Satan doesn't get there until after the millennial reign. You see, the beast and the false prophet don't even partake in this battle with the Lord. He sees them all gathered together with the kings of the earth and their armies and everything coming against him and his army. And what does it say? And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet. Bam, taken and thrown alive into the lake of fire. And then he brings about the destruction on these guys. Well, this one's a battle. Do you realize that in, uh, after the millennial reign, 
when Satan comes out and deceives one more time, because there'll been a thousand years of people living, people were living long time again, hundreds of years. There's going to be a lot of people again. And what happens? That one, the Father comes from heaven and whew, burns them all. That's a different story, isn't it? <clears throat> That's a different story. So we can see what's taking place in here. And we know that Antichrist is killed and then comes back. We have shown it in some beautiful places. And I'm going to do a little rehash on this. And I'm, I'm going to make it quick. When you understand the revelation of the discourses, you're going to see, see nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, troubles, sorrows. You know, they're going to be coming against you, beaten. Some of you are going to be put to death. But there's no Antichrist yet. The Antichrist and the false prophet don't show up until the time of the abomination of desolation, which is what? Okay, the abomination of desolation. And then look, in Mark 13, verse 22, then you get the term false Christ and false prophet showing up. But they weren't in the first half. Because approximately the first half of tribulation starting in seals is World War III. Sure, Antichrist will be here, false prophet will be here, all these guys will be here, but the power of when he's given power to continue 42 months, he doesn't get it until about middish seals, which is uh, um, after World War III, when everybody will scre be screaming for a savior of any kind. When you come to Matthew, so what do we know happens? So in Mark 13, you see false Christs and false prophets, which is the indication of now they're, they're showing up on the scene with the power and the authority. And what happens? We know that when the Son of Man comes after the tribulation of those days at the end of the sixth seal, we know that Antichrist gets killed, but not the false prophet. You see? So what happens now when you go to Matthew's discourse? I love this story. This, this is such an exciting find, but you must understand the Gospels and who they're speaking to to understand the timing of the discourses, the differences in the abominations. Look at what you see now. In Matthew 24, verse 7, nation shall rise against nation. So you got their portion in Matthew. And look at this. Matthew 24, verse 11. You only see false prophets. So if this is the typology of the beginning of trumpets, only the false prophet is around, but no mention of Antichrist. So you see, at the, in the second half of seals, he was. In the first half of trumpets, he is not. And then what do you get? You get Matthew's abomination of desolation. And you go down to verse Matthew 24, verse 24. And then you've got the story. For there shall rise false Christs and false prophets. All of a sudden, false Christ shows up on the scene again. Why? Because he was, is not, and shall be. Isn't it awesome? This is, this is exactly what you're reading <coughs> in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when it says, starting uh, in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who, shall oppo who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Why? Because the son of perdition is going to what? Come again. When the pit is opened, it's the time of the son of perdition. And you get exactly that in Revelation chapter 11 or 9. Uh, let's go to Revelation 9 is where the story starts. In Revelation 9, we're going to cover this still a little bit too. In Revelation 9 is what? When the fifth angel sounded. You see, if you go to the, if you go to, let's go into the trumpets here. So when you get to the trumpets, you end up seeing in the trumpets, you have one, two, three, four trumpets. And when the fourth trumpet is done, in Revelation 8, 13, it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of other voices of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels 
which are yet to sound. You see, the final three trumpets are the three woes. So when you get to Revelation 9, the fifth trumpet is the first woe. And what is the fifth trumpet? Star falls from heaven and what happens? He has the key to the bottomless pit. And what does he do? He opens the bottomless pit. Who is the one that comes from the bottomless pit? You see? Who's the one that comes from bottomless pit? 2 Thessalonians 2. For the great falling away, is son, uh, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The son of perdition is the one that comes out of the bottomless pit. And what's he going to do? He's going to make war. See that? Revelation 11, verse 7. What is Revelation 11, verse 7? You'll see. Watch this. It says, and when they shall have finished their testimony. So the two witnesses, which we know are witnessing for 1260 days during the first half of trumpets. It says, and when they shall have finished their testimony. So about mid trumpets time. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. <laughs> Doesn't get more clear than that, right? How did anybody ever explain this before? If he was, is not, and shall be. Do you understand why I say how powerful this is? It could never have been understood in seven years, everybody looking through the lens of Matthew. Remember what we said about the, the war in uh, Daniel 9, verse 26? Look at the rest of, of Revelation uh, eleven seven. Comes out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. How long do we know that war lasts? Two and a half years, because when Satan is cast down and the pit is opened, you see, he's given what? Time, times, and a half, two and a half years. Which is why when he kills them, as we see here in Revelation 11, and then an hour later they stand up and there's a great earthquake and everything else, listen to what it says. The second woe is past. That's the sixth trumpet. The seventh woe is the seventh trumpet. Seventh trumpet is the destruction that comes, right? So, let's see how this plays out. When we go into the bowls, there's none of this conversation. This is all related to trumpets. You see, if, if, the, if the bowls and the trumpets were connected together, meaning, say, for example, like, like some people would say uh, in seven years, they'll, they'll connect bowls and trumpets and seals. They'll, they'll sandwich everything together. But what happens is the time of trumpets is not against the enemy. You see, even look at when the pit is open. When the pit is opened, Satan with the Antichrist who has come back from the pit and the false prophet have two and a half years of reigning on the earth. Two and a half years of rule and of destruction of going after everything. Destroying it all. Whereas the bull judgments is the destruction against everything that's the enemy. See what that difference is? <clears throat> Let's go now see some of these bowls. Do I want to start in the bowls or do we go to the seventh trumpet? Let's go to the seventh trumpet and see some wording first. So remember, soon as it sounds, the mystery is done because the Lord has now returned, right? And so in verse uh, Revelation 11, starting verse 15, and the seventh angel sounded, which means the mystery is over. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hello. He doesn't rule and reign forever and ever until that point, right? Remember what Matthew 28 said? Matthew 28 and their commission in verse 18, 
It said, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in the earth. When? When he comes as what? Verse, verse uh, 3 of Matthew 28, as lightning. Okay? There's that word for lightning. As he comes as lightning from one end unto the other. And we know that they're going to now go out and teach whatever so, whatever so he commands them. And he's now with them until the end of the world, which means he's now going to be here until the end of the millennial reign. <coughs> so we go back to Revelation 11. We know that it's at the sounding of the seventh trumpet there. And we go down to verse, continue from verse 17, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art, which us, which art to come, because thou hast taken thy great power and has reigned. Now listen to this. Here it comes. Verse 18. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. Now you've got the nations that are angry because your wrath is come. And the time that the dead should be judged and that thou shouldest reward unto thy servant. Give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and unto the saints and to them that fear thy name, small and great. And what? And shouldest destroy them that destroyed the earth. You see? There's still a destruction coming. He shows up, all power is now given unto him, but the world's not all submitting to him. You see, now he's seen, the mystery is over, but there's still an incredible battle that's about to take place. This is that Revelation 19 connection. This is the Zechariah 14. So what can we discern? Well, first of all, we know it's, it's God the Father, right? It's, it's the Father. It's the Lord God Almighty's wrath is come. And the nations now are angry. Could you imagine how terrible it must have been on the earth when it gets to this point? That they're angry? They're angry that, that the Lord has now seen the mystery is done? They must be just all demon-possessed, right? Because they're angry. Why would you be angry? Because you don't belong to the Lord. You never repented. They don't even repent seeing him come down. Do you think the Lord still has mercy at this point? Yep, he sure does. But is it, is it, uh, it's kind of like one of those things. He still has mercy. However, that mercy is going to fall on deaf ears as we're going to see. So it is telling us that he still has mercy, that they could still turn. But none of them do. Well, of course not. You know why? They've taken the mark of the beast. They're not going to turn. You see? So that thou shouldest destroy the earth. And then 11, uh, Revelation 11, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in the temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail let's go to the bowls revelation 15 and i saw another sign in heaven great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues okay last plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of god okay there's the wrath of the Lamb and there's the wrath of God. Is Jesus God? Yes, he's God. He's not God the Father. Okay, there's a difference. That's why, like we explained in Revelation 20, who is it? Why does it say God there and God comes and destroys them with fire? And then Satan is thrown into the pit where the other two are. In, sorry, into the lake of fire. How, how could it be Jesus up above Blowing the fire down when the Lord Jesus was here on the earth. He's the one in the camp with the saints. Remember, they all had their land. All of Israel and Jerusalem. It's protected. It's, it's their promised millennial reign. They've been resurrected. The, the disciples that were there during seals and working for the Lord. 
They're there. They're resurrected. They're ruling and reigning with him. The Lord is there. That's what we read in, in Matthew 28, that he's now with them until the end of the world because he's here. He is the promise, the Isaiah, the, the, uh, the Isaac, the promise in the 14th year. You see? So he's here during the millennial reign, which means the wrath of God is coming from the Father. The wrath of the Lamb was the end of seals. Jesus is still having part in it, though. Remember that, right? But you see, it's the wrath of God. And in Revelation 19, we saw that it was, it was uh, the Lamb, that it was Jesus, right? But he was given it for the Father, the, the Lord God Almighty, and his wrath. Well, here it is. Let's have a read. 15 verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a city of glass. Okay, there's a mark. Okay, there, there. Oh, yeah, this is actually pretty good, too. In verse 2 again. Revelation 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over the mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Okay? Never had the mark, never took the mark, and so forth, right? They now sing the song of Moses. Um, verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Verse 5. And after that, I looked and beheld, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Well, they saw it at the end of the seventh trumpet too, right? And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven uh, uh, plagues clothed in pure white, girded about. Verse 7, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels the seven golden vials or bowls of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And listen to this. And no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Why does this matter? Why? No man. Why could no man enter? Well, if you remember, at the end of Matthew's gospel, which is the end, right? The, the seventh trumpet, the Lord coming at the seventh trumpet. What's he going to do? We know this relates to the 12 tribes and those who are going to go out through all nations, teaching, no longer preaching because the Lord's there. They're going to go out teaching the ways of the Lord. Okay? Teaching them in verse 20, the last verse of Matthew 28 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Okay? <clears throat> what are some of the things that they're going to be teaching? Well, for that, let's go to Zechariah 14. In Zechariah 14, we know that they're going to be teaching, but listen to what it says. <clears throat> verse 16, Zechariah 14, starting in verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations, there's here all the nations, which came against Jerusalem, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever shall not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, <clears throat> the Lord of hosts, even upon them, shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What's something they're going to be doing? teaching them to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, teaching the ways of the Lord. You see, 
Remember what the Lord said. When he comes, he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. You can imagine some people may not be too happy during the millennial reign, right? Why would there be this warning that if they don't come up to, to worship him as king and Lord? Probably because there will be some at some point throughout that won't. And their warning will first be rain. Their second one is they'll be, they'll be struck with plague. Do you think that's because they're being warned because it's not going to happen during the millennial reign? Remember what he said. He said he's going to rule with a rod of iron when he comes to rule and reign during the millennial reign. Do you know when you go to Revelation chapter 12, listen to what it says. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, you see the from verse 1 through verse 5 is all about seals. Okay? In verse 5 is when the Son of Man comes at the end of the sixth seal. He's coming in the clouds as Matthew's discourse. Okay? And it says in verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. You see that? Who was to. Meaning, during the first half of trumpets, when he's here as the Son of Man on Mount Zion, and they're rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple, what we saw in Daniel chapter 9, right before he's what? Cut off because Satan's been cast down at mid-trumpets. He wasn't yet ruling with this rod of iron. You see? He wasn't there as King of Kings and Lord of Lords yet. He was King and High Priest. He was king and high priest. In fact, you get this exact understanding in Psalms. Whoops, in Psalms. Did I stay in Psalms? Yeah. In Psalms 110. You see, starting in verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies, thy enemies thy footstool. And the Lord, Father, shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. So what's he doing? The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. What's happening here? It's the 144,000. It's the 144,000 that are the ones being sent out, the rod of his strength that are going out during trumpets. You see? And he's to rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Who is he? Verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest. After the order of Melchizedek. What was Melchizedek? King and priest. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Right? What's he going to do? Strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Remember at the end of the sixth year of seals. But he's not ruling as a rod of iron. He is a high priest king Melchizedek type during the first half of trumpets. He's not ruling with that rod of iron until he comes at the end until he comes at the end of trumpets. And I think we might even get that same wording um, in Yeah, right here. Revelation 19:15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he shall smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You see, he's going to rule them with a rod of iron during the millennial reign. This is what's happening. Okay, so what are we seeing here with again? Going back to finish this point, that, that's all part of this, that no man might enter. Well, these guys are going out to teach during the millennial reign. What are they going to be teaching them to do? To do the ways of the Lord and to what? Enter into Jerusalem during the millennial reign, right? Every year. Every year from the start of the millennial reign, which includes the Jubilee. Which means at the end of the 14 years, right? At the end of the 14 years, when it's over and the tribes come back in that first year of the millennial reign has started. 
there to what? Go and worship him in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. Which means if no man can enter until the seven plagues of the seven angels were done, then it must also, you see, it's more evidence telling us that these plagues will take place before the end of the 14 years. You see how that works? Let's go to chapter 16. There's, uh, again, you see the seven vials. Oh, just so you guys can see it, okay? A broad, shallow cup. Okay, if you go into the word definition of it, it'll say a bowl, right? So it's a shallow cup, a bowl. So uh, we see pour out. See? Go your ways and pour out. See? To pour forth. Isn't that what we saw too, one of the definitions? See, to pour out. What was this definition from? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Sometime in the latter portion, towards the end of the 14th year. So pour out. I'm going to highlight that in another color. Pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. The first went out and poured his vial upon the earth, and there fell noisome and grievous sore upon the man, listen to this, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped the Im his image. See? Clearly, the time of the end. The mark of the beast, so those who had it, will not be saved. They're done, but you're going to see he's still giving them the option, but we know they're not going to take it. Why? Because they're the ones that have the mark. And it says, <clears throat> And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as blood of a dead man. Now listen to this. And every, let me highlight this. And every living soul died in the sea. Okay? So this isn't, it just became as blood. It became as the blood of a dead man. Which means actual blood. And everything in the sea died. So if we go back to the, the trumpets, and you go to the seventh trumpet, and you see the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. The third part. And what happened? The third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Okay? So there's clearly a difference already by the second one. So when you get to, that's the second trumpet, which is the third, right? When you get to the second bowl, you see that everything, okay? Upon the sea, and it became as blood of a dead man, not a third of it, all of it, okay? And every living thing, every living soul died in the sea, not a third, you see? So what do we have in seals? In seals, we see a quarter of everything being killed. In trumpets, you see another third of everything that's left, even after everything that takes place and the rapture and everything else. Bang, you got another third. When you get to the end here in trumpets, it's like not everything, but in relation to killing everybody, but it's everything, like the sea, everything. It's, it's, it's all toast now. Uh, verse four, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. Not a third, okay? So what ends up happening? What ends up happening when the rivers and the fountains of waters, which means fresh water, what happens when the rivers and the fountains of waters, which are the fresh water, become blood? Not a third, you see? Let's go to, let's go back into 
Revelation 8 and see the third trumpet. Third trumpet uh, burning, right? It's called Wormwood. And what do you get? The third part of the waters became Wormwood, right? And men died of the waters because they were made bitter. But it was the third part. Fourth angel, a third part of the sun, a third part of the moon, a third part of the stars, right? Of them that got darkened. But in the third trumpet, wormwood makes a third of all waters bitter, which is poisonous and causes them to die. In the third bowl, we see in the third bowl that poured out on the rivers and fountains, they became blood, which means what? There's nothing for them to drink. Nothing. There's no more fresh water. You see, in, in trumpets, at the third trumpet, it was only a third. And whoever drank of those third of the waters on the earth, they died from the poison of it. At this point, they can't drink anything. All fresh water is now turned to blood. How long do you think they'll live if all they have is blood? Listen to what the angel says about it. Revelation 16, verse 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which, ha uh, which art, which was, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. See? They, they, there's no choice. They, all they'll have is blood. Well, they've been bloodthirsty. They've been eating people, don't forget. Now they'll have no water to drink. How long do you think the trumpets can actually go on? You see? There's no water. Everything's turned to blood. Uh, verse 7. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Again, not the same as the others, right? Not the same as the fourth trumpet. And so now this one's got the power to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not. You see that? And they repented not, which means what? They probably still could have. But why wouldn't they? Because they're all the ones that took the mark and worshiped the image. Where are we? Uh, and repented not. Verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Where's the seed of the beast? Hold on, wait a second. The beast poured it upon the seed of the beast, so chances are the beast is still there. The only way the beast could be there is if he wasn't yet destroyed right at that final war, which means this even has to happen right before that final war. Because the beast and the, anti, uh, the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire before the war. It's almost, it, it almost seems as if the Lord is actually giving them one more chance. Could you imagine? Never we said his mercy. Talk about mercy. This is over the top. We're at the bold judgments for crying out loud. But what do we know? They're not going to repent, right? They don't care. It's over. And the fact that we've got the seed of the beast, this is pretty interesting. Because where do we know the seed of the beast is? If we go to Revelation chapter 2, in Revelation chapter 2, when you get to Pergamum, right? The church of Pergamum, uh, verse 13, Revelation 2, verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest even where the seat of Satan is. 
That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Now you might say, well, wait a second, the seed of Satan, Pergamum is during seals, right? Remember, when you go to the seven churches, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll understand there's even a reason why there's uh, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira of the seven churches. Why didn't they just put all seven churches in one chapter? There was a spirit-led reason for it. There's a spirit-led reason. It relates to seals. When you get to, what's, what's the other one? Uh, 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 um, S something? Sardis. When you get to Sardis, that's the Lord having come at the end of seals in that seventh year of trumpets. So my point that I'm getting at here, it says even where Satan's seed is. Well, you would say, well, first of all, there, sh there should be a couple questions. One, it says it's Satan's seed. It doesn't say that it's the beast. Well, it's like the father and the son guys, right? They're, they're united. They're tightly knit together. Who do you think is going to give Satan's seat to the beast, the Antichrist? Satan is. When is he going to do it? At mid-seals. Remember? Revelation chapter 13. In Revelation chapter 13, we see that um, he takes power, right? So the beast, which I saw, was like a leopard, like a bear, like a lion, right? These are the description from Daniel 7. This fourth beast is, is controlling now, after World War III, has control over Syria as the lion, has control over the bear as Russia, and I believe it's Germany, which is the leopard, which is the body. And it's this beast that now has control over the systems, over everything, and he's going to rule and reign, and they're going to now have to worship him. But what happens at this point? This is when, in Revelation 13, verse 5, see, speaking blasphemies and great things, and was given power, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Who gave him his power? to continue 42 months. You see, meaning he was already in some position. He will already be here. He's probably already here, just not indwelt with the raven spirit. He's already here. But who's going to give him his power? The dragon. The dragon gave him his power and his seat. See that? The dragon gave him his power, which one do I want to use, and his seat. So whose seat is it? It's the dragon's. And he gives it to who? The beast. When does he give it to him? At the time of mid-seals when he's going to be given power to continue for 42 months. Remember, there's going to be, it doesn't mean that Satan is going to be here. But there's something going on with Satan's connection during seals as well. And I'm going to prove it to you. Because we see it in Revelation chapter 12. You see, Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 5, as we had shared, is the first portion of seals. You see, here's your was caught up. This was caught up is the, is the uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, I think it is. This is the was caught up of the great multitude rapture to paradise in the seventh year of seals. What happens before the rapture of the great multitude was caught up? Man-child, who's to rule all nations with a rod of iron, he shows up at the end of the sixth seal. Then you have the was caught up to paradise in the seventh year of seals. That is your mid-trib rapture, the mark group. But what do you see before that? We know the escape happens, the stones throw, Right, The Son of Man, the 40 days represented, the pain to be delivered, represents the first two and a half years of seals. This word right here, right here, pain to be delivered. This word pain is the representation of the first two and a half years of seals. This portion above is the escape and the stone's throw time. The travailing in birth is the 40 days of the Son of Man. This is the beginning of the 14 years, and it equals two and a half years. 
You want to know how I can show you? Because in verse 3 it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. When does the Antichrist get his power to continue? After the stuff of World War III took place. Remember Daniel 7. It was the lion, the bear, the leopard. Then the fourth beast came. We go to Revelation 13. The fourth beast is what? All the other three. And then he's given power to continue 42 months. And he's given power by who? The dragon. And then you get to verse 4. And his tail drew a third of the stars. This has to do with um, the sixth seal and the untimely fig trees, like a fig being cast down to the earth. And then you've got to the end of the sixth seal and into the seventh year of seals when the rapture of the great multitude happens. Okay? So we can see that the Antichrist is getting his seat. The beast is getting his seat from the dragon and the dragon seat is connected to pergamum well isn't that interesting because you see in in revelation 13 verse 12 it says the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard so the body is the leopard remember i say the control center i've always believed it's going to be out of germany right all up in that area and probably has the the connection with um What's over there? Uh, not, not the EU, is it? The, the one with the woman riding the beast, and it looks like they built the Temple of Babel incompletely finished, right? That, that one um, nation's building or something. I can't remember which one it is now. But you see, all of, that period, all of that is connected to the leopard, which is Germany. You see, Germany, World War I, Germany, World War II. It doesn't mean that, please understand, it doesn't mean that everybody in Germany is bad. In fact, you know, the, it all came out through Germany and all up in that area with the, the Reformation and everything else, right? So you kind of see the counter, right? Whatever the, the Lord does, it's countered by the enemy. And the reason I'm saying Germany is we just saw that the connection to where Satan's seed is, is Pergamum. And what did Hitler do? Right? Was it Hitler? I believe it was Hitler. When they discovered where the, the seat of Satan was in Pergamum, right? They they didn't just have the they didn't have it rebuilt. They didn't have a copy of it made like Obama did. Right? They actually took it, excavated it, and brought it to the museum in Germany. So where do you think Satan's seat is now when the body is the leopard? Remember, they had the leopard tanks. There's a connection to the leopard. It's pretty wild. Now, the other thing you would say in this, and you say, well, wait a second, this is during seals. When we're talking about this in trumpets, uh, sorry, in bowls, <coughs> and it says, verse 10, when the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and darkness and pain, you got to remember when the Antichrist, when the beast comes back up out of the pit and Satan's been cast down, having lost his battle in heaven, like Revelation 12 says, which is mid-trumpets time, it even tells you it's a woe because it represents the first woe. Where is this power in this seat still going to be? In Pergamum. Sure, he's going to step into the temple and declare himself God. But that's not where his seat is. His seat is in Pergamum. And the one who gave him the seat is Satan the dragon. Let's keep going. And blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores and repented not. There it was again. And they still never repented. Revelation 16, verse 12. This is one I always like to point to. We're at the sixth bowl. And he poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. Oh, no. It's, yeah, it's part of this one. <clears throat> upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That's kind of interesting, right? 
it almost seems like there's still something that's been going on this whole time. Kings of the East, in the end of days, probably has its representation, right? Rising of the East, where does the sun rise? In the East, it's probably connected to China. Which means in the midst of all this, you know, who better represents the great red dragon? Right? Kind of makes sense. But remember, we're, we're not playing in a, in a local scale like it was in, in, in millennia's past. We're talking globally this time. This is the entire earth this time that's going to be involved. So who are the kings of the east? Probably China. You see? Remember what I said, how the bulls seem to be taking place even right before that final seventh sword battle? Do you follow it now? It's this, this final battle with that final sword hasn't taken place yet. It's like the bulls are happening towards the very end of trumpets, the seventh trumpet, before that final sword takes place. So why is it suddenly in the bulls that the kings of the east are now coming? Well, the kings of the east probably represent the dragons people, right? Let's see what it says. This is the one I like to point to. In Revelation 16, verse 13, this is again the evidence that this can't be at the end of the millennial reign. It can't even be at the time of the war. Do you get it? It can't even be at the Revelation 19 when he comes to make war. Because listen to what happens. Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, and out of the mouth of the beast, there he is, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. How is that possible if the false prophet and the beast are cast into the lake of fire first when the war is about to break out? This means it's before the second sword is over of the seventh trumpet let's keep going verse 14 and they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into all the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of almighty god well isn't that interesting zachariah 14 so all of the bulls were taking place before the battle you see you don't have to guess anymore it's before the battle of Almighty God. And here's the white horse rider. See, he's coming to make war. And what happens? He has what? Uh, verse 15, Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness, here it is, and the wrath of Almighty God. You see, the bulls take place before this final second sword happens. And right before, when they're all gathered together, they're all ready to come and fight. Right again, verse 18, Revelation 19, verse 18. Uh, eat the man of the flesh of king. No, where is it? Verse 20. Oh, no, no, sorry, verse 19, 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, you see, and their armies gathered together to make war. Why did they come to gather together to make war? Because spirits like frogs went out of the mouth of the beast, the false prophet, and Satan, and went into the kings of the earth. You get it now? And look what happens. Right as they're about to make war, before it all starts, he says, to heck with you, beast and false prophet, in verse 20. Bam, I'm taking you guys out right away. Even before the war starts, those two are taken out. And then the war begins. So now you can see when you get into the bulls, you can see this probably better than you ever have in your life now. 
Because in Revelation 13, you see, the war hadn't even happened. The spirit, the three unclean spirits like frogs went out of all three of them first. The only way that could happen is if all three of them or either of all three weren't yet in the lake of fire. But we know that the beast and the false prophet are the first two taken into the lake of fire right before the battle. But not before the spirits go out of their mouth into the kings of the earth to bring them to the great battle. This is awesome. I'm so excited. Thank you guys for asking me to share on this one. I haven't done one in this detail ever. So again, Revelation 16, verse 14. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the great to the battle of the great and almighty God. Now listen to this. Verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and that keep his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Pretty wild, right? Why do I say pretty wild? Remember I told you the seven churches, we know they're going to play out again in the end of days. We revealed it. We got the video that follows the, the greater detail. Well, just as we are in Laodicea now, <coughs> it will be Laodicea again at that time. From about the, the mid-trumpets point to the end of trumpets is the final age of Laodicea. And listen to what it says. Uh, reverse... Verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked and naked. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You see, tried in the fire, went through tribulation in relation to is to come, that thou mayest be rich in white, ra in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Get the picture? Right? Being naked, being naked. And what's it all about? Here it is. Here he is, coming as a thief at the end of all of tribulation, now the bowls have been done. The end of the seventh trumpet is coming. The great battle. And what does he tell them? In Revelation 6, uh, 16, 15 again. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked. See that? Now you're getting to the end of the seventh trumpet See, the bulls are a part of the end of that 14th year. It's exactly why that exact wording is there in Daniel 9, verse 27. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, listen to this, Armageddon. What's the, what's, what's the, Hebrew, what's the Greek word? 717. It's only used one time. 717. Isn't that amazing that the end of the 14 years of tribulation is 717? How do we know? What is the seven? What does tribulation actually start with? Remember the connection to Genesis 717 when the 40 days start? The typology of the Son of Man and the 40 days? 717? Do you remember the story, right? How about Deuteronomy 16? Deuteronomy 16, they're the three feasts to the Lord. It's about pre, mid, and post. It's called what? Seven days for unleavened bread, one day for feast of weeks, and seven days for booths, of which the eighth day is the new beginning, which is what? One day for pre-trib. Seven days as the seven years of unleavened bread. Seven days as seven years of booths for Matthew's portion. And the eighth day, what is the new beginning? What does it equal? Seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, new beginning. The 22nd or the eighth day as the trumpets, tabernacles time. And what did it start with? 
It started with the escape, which is the Feast of Weeks. 717 plays out as 177. And what you see in the name of Genesis, <coughs> or in Genesis 7, comma 17, it looks like the Father's name, right? It looks like right from right to left, the way they the way the, the Jews read it. It looks like, right, what is it? Yod Hey Vav Hey. Right? So you have this seven comma one seven, it looks like. <coughs> because it's one, then seven, and then the final seven is for Judah. It's awesome. And Armageddon, so it starts with 717, and it ends with 717. And let me show you something about 717 and Armageddon. <clears throat> it comes from two Hebrew words. One is mountain, okay? The other one relating to Armageddon. And it's the Hebrew word 4023. Now, because this word is only used one time in the Greek, it helps to go to the Hebrew to see what it means, right? So we go to 4023. Check this out. As I bring this to a close, <clears throat> okay? A place of crowds, right? Because that's where he's gathering them. It's a fitting end. But I want you to see something very telling that we have taught on. Look at where it starts, where the first place it's been talked about. Megiddo and Megiddo. So the, the Hebrew for Armageddon is spoken about for the first time in the book of Joshua. Do you know why? For those of you who have been watching for a while, of course you know why. Remember what we've shared? That Moses is the typology, the representation of the time of seals for the house of Israel. Right? Remember the house of Israel, the Gentiles are grafted in and so forth, right? And remember what happened? <coughs> Moses took them through it all. <coughs> remember Moses brought them into the wilderness. So what's the typology when he brings them into the wilderness? It's the typology of when they flee. Okay? In the, in the end time years, it's Mark's discourse, the abomination of desolation. When Antichrist gets that power to continue 42 months, that's the Moses representation, Mark 13, abomination of desolation, and Moses is leading them into the wilderness. <clears throat> but what happened? What happened at the end of seals? What's the typology at the end of seals? John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist came and reunited them all, right? Brought father and mother and son and daughter, all of them back together again. We know seals isn't like that. Seals is division. And then John the Baptist type is going to bring them all back, right? The Elijah type. Well, Elijah went up in a chariot like those that will be raptured, not tasting of death, of the great multitude. <laughs> and then you've got those who did die, which are the representation of John the Baptist. Well, what is Moses in that typology? Moses is the same thing. Like a John, he ended up dying. Okay? <clears throat> he didn't go up in a chariot. He didn't, uh, he didn't get beheaded. But he died. He wasn't able to bring them over into the promised land. <clears throat> you see, Moses isn't going to bring them into the promised land. John the Baptist isn't going to be the one to bring them into the promised land. <clears throat> Who is? Well, Jesus, of course. Right? It's the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. Right? And after the Ezekiel 39 war, Antichrist is killed, as we said. And then what happens? It's, it's Yeshua. It's Yeshua Jesus bringing them over into the promised land. It's pretty wild, right? Well, let me prove it out to you. In Numbers chapter 13, this was such a huge revelation, all of this in Numbers 13. We got so much because, oh my goodness, did it ever give us a bunch. This, this was what helped give us the revelation <coughs> of the 50 days and the connection to Taurus and being right on target and Al De Baron and 14th brightest star in the sky and it represents 50 and the pendant Jesus was wearing. I mean, my goodness, we can go on and on. But listen to this. In Numbers 13, starting in verse 8, it says the tribe of Ephraim, okay, of the tribe of Ephraim, Osi. Osi means what? Deliverer. Who is the deliverer? Jesus, right? 
Jesus is the deliverer. Osi means Hosea. Look at this. Savior, get victory. That's the pre-trib, bride of Christ, Gentile bride going. And look at what happens. He's the son of noon. The son of noon is Taurus, right? It's, it's, the, it's the bullseye of Taurus. Well, watch this. In Numbers uh, 13, 16, it says, These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Osi, see, Hosea, Savior, the son of noon. He changed his name to Yeshua. He changed his name to Yeshua. And Yeshua is what? Jesus. What is Jesus? What does he become at the end of seals? He's now the Jewish leader, right? He will save. It's Yeshua. Deliverer from Hosea becomes Yeshua. He will save who is the leader of the Jews. Pretty wild, right? So what ends up happening in Deuteronomy chapter 34? We see the city of palm trees, verse uh, chapter 34, verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. Bam. Who brings them over, brothers and sisters? Of course, you all know the story. Joshua brings them over. All right. Verse one, halfway through the Lord, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, right? Yeshua, Moses' minister saying, Moses, thy servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give unto them, even to the children of Israel. You see this? This is the story of the end of seals to the rapture, to the end of seals going to the start of trumpets, and where are they going to heavenly Mount Zion to paradise, which is probably going to be somewhere above the mountains. I don't know what it's going to look like, how it's going to play out, but this is the time of the rapture of the great multitude. Moses didn't take them over. John isn't going to be able to, the Baptist type isn't going to be able to take them over. It is going to be Yeshua, Joshua, taking them over into the promised land. That's why he's there at the end of the sixth seal as well. Destroy the enemies, bang, take them over. Okay? So what is, time, what is the portion of time that Joshua represents? Trumpets. Trumpets. So isn't it fitting that midway through, right? Midway to the later portion, midway through portion, of the book of Joshua, you have the story start to break out about Megiddo. Isn't that connected to when Antichrist, uh, uh, when Antichrist comes back, Satan is cast down, Antichrist is brought back, the son of perdition comes up from the pit, false prophet is there again, Messiah gets cut off. Doesn't Joshua fight against the giants? Well, Check this out. We can even bring more evidence to this. And the reason we can bring more evidence is because it goes to one of our chapters to years. Joshua was good <laughs> because we know the difference from the Moses representation of seals, and we've taught on it, and the representation of Joshua to trumpets, which we've taught on. Well, look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 11. Isn't it fitting that it's in Zechariah chapter 12? In that second half portion of trumpets. Listen to this. Starting in Zechariah 12 verse 2. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. Unto all the people round about. When they shall be in the siege. Both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Hello. Is this happening during the, the 12th year in, of tribulation in the midst of trumpets? No. He's saying, I will make. He's going to make it a cup of trembling to all those that compass about and are ready to besiege it. When do we know it? At the end of trumpets. 
it says, verse 3, and in that day, see, not yet, in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people and all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered against it. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. How crazy is that, right? Now, where's the verse? Watch this. You're going to see. How do we know it's at the end? Well, remember when Messiah is cut off? We know he's going to do something again. So that when he returns, they're going to see him who they've pierced. Right? Zechariah 12. Verse 10, halfway through. And they look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day, there it is again, verse 11. In that day, there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Armageddon in the valley of Megiddon. There's going to be one just as it was. So shall it be. The connection to this is absolutely perfect. It is all supposed to be about the time of trumpets and the cutting off and and the again that he's going to do that when he returns. Well, when does he return that they're going to see it? And that they would all weep and say, oh, no, it'll be at the 14th year of, tri- of, Trump, of tribulation, which is the seventh trumpet. It's crazy. You see, so for anybody else that's new, let me show you something. This is really cool. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because it's just a little side note. But you see, there's a difference between the temple that Moses had and Solomon's temple, right? So there were two types of temples that had been built in history. One of them was covered in skin, and the other one was a physical one made in stone. This one, which is Moses's, is portable, and it's covered in flesh. Remember I said that the abomination of desolation that takes place in Mark's portion is the Moses time frame typology in the was. And that's when they would flee into the wilderness. The same typology of Moses' story. Moses' temple, the temple back then was what? Covered in skin and it was portable. What are you? Covered in skin and portable? That's because the mark of the beast from Revelation 13 will begin when the Antichrist gets his power to continue 42 months, which is the abomination of desolation in Mark, placed where it ought not be. But in trumpets, and the time relating to Joshua's portion when the Lord is here, we know the temple, the physical temple is going to be rebuilt. And when the physical temple is rebuilt, it's no longer the temple of flesh because the mark of the beast will have already been initiated, right? It was already done. When Antichrist was killed at the end of seals, there's no more receiving the mark of the beast. You see, the mark of the beast is putting in, is going to be put in to the temple, which is the flesh that is portable. The, the abomination of desolation in Matthew is the one that is the physical temple, that when he comes back out of the pit, when Satan is cast down and the pit is open, and all three of them are there again, it will actually be the temple that was rebuilt, that they will declare, he will step in and declare himself. It's crazy, isn't it? Man, it's so awesome. It's so, so awesome. And look at how it ends. So see, We can now know and understand that these bowls are a short period of time during the seventh year of trumpets in which the the sword 
second sword final battle of the Lord doesn't happen till after the bowls have been poured out. He's telling us right here. Because everything must be over in 14 years. It's the fractal. It's, it's the all of creation story to all of the end time story. It must be over after 14 years. Because when the 14th year is over, we see not only that false prophet and antichrist, right? The beast are thrown into the lake of fire, which they weren't here. And we see that the sword, that they're all gathered because the spirit of frogs went out. And then when they're all gathered together at the battle for Armageddon towards the very end of that seventh trumpet, bam, the false prophet and the beast are thrown into the lake of fire and the battle of Armageddon takes place. That is the Lord's second sword, which will end the seventh trumpet and bring an end to the 14 years of tribulation. And look at how it ends with the seventh bowl. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice. Listen to this. Sounds like the trump, seventh trumpet, right? Out of, his temp, out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Interesting, right? Because at the start of the seventh trumpet, it is done. You see, or I should say it is done. It is finished. Because the whole world will see him. He's as lightning from one end unto the other. But he still must deal with the enemy in that final 14th year. And when that is dealt with, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Hello. See? The wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That final sword battle, right? Now taking place. Um, verse 20 and 21. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God and the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great. See that? Again, still blasphemy because they have the mark of the beast. You see, now this takes us back and we end it here in Revelation chapter 19, the white horse rider. Do you remember how it plays out? Do you remember why all that follows and all this with the wedding? Because if you recall, the way the wedding story played out in ancient Israel is the story of the end of days. You see, if, if my son, okay, my son's maybe two years old, and my best friend had a little daughter, and we're best friends. We're like, man, they, we got to get these two married. We're best friends. We got to keep it together, right? And so we make an agreement right there that these two are going to marry. She's just born. My son's two. And we made this agreement. But she can't marry till she's 13. And at, at, when she turns 13, they would make a marriage contract, right? It, it's, it's, they're officially married when she turns 13. But... It's not, the, it's not the end of the story. They have a legal marriage, but they haven't had the whole wedding and everything else yet. She has one year to prepare for the wedding with her bridesmaids. That's the story that's going on. For everybody that doesn't know and who's still listening that's new, that's the story everybody doesn't know of Matthew because they all think Matthew is the seven years of tribulation. Even though 
it's chapter 25 at the end of all the tribulation. <clears throat> they think the foolish and wise virgins is pre-trib. It has zero to do with it. You see, it's all about the end of the 13 years. And when the 13 years are over, she's now legally married. They've now come into the agreement. They're legally married. And he now goes and prepares a place. And when he goes and prepares a place for that one year, she remains with her bridesmaids, making her dress, getting all bedazzled and jeweled up and all beautiful and getting ready. And it takes about one year. They don't know exactly what day and what hour, but there's an approximate time frame, right? It's about one year. And when that one year comes, you see, this, just like Matthew 25, the bridegroom's coming and the, 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 the shofar sounds. And the bridesmaids go and say, oh, I don't have enough oil. And some of them do and some of them don't, right? And then he goes in. They went to get oil. They come back. Sorry, I don't know you. They have nothing to do with the bride. They're the bridesmaids. When does that happen? In the 14th, at the end of the 14th year. You see how awesome that is? It's at the end of the 14th year. The story is 13 years, one year to clean up and prepare everything. When it's all over, bang! She has a place in, her fa in his father's house. You see how awesome that is? The story of the end of days of seals and trumpets is the story of the covenant with a to-be husband and wife. 13 years, then she can marry, one year to prepare, and bang. You see? What happens when you continue in the story? They all started rejoicing, right? Even here in 19, they're rejoicing in heaven. The marriage supper of the Lamb is coming. Hallelujah. His wife has made herself ready. Let those who are called to the wedding, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. You see, she's ready. And what does he got to do? One final cleanup. And when all of this is done, when he finally destroys and uses that second and final sword, like Zechariah 14, we'll round it all back and close it up in a nice bow. What does he have to do? You see? All nations against Jerusalem. Da, 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 da. Verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. You see? There was one. This is the second one. End of seals, end of trumpets. And what is he going to do? When the battle is all done, what is he going to do? You remember, right? I forgot where it was. <laughs> Verse 8 of Zechariah 14. And it shall be in that day that the living waters shall go out from Jerusalem. Everything will be renewed and when everything is renewed and everything has been completed after he destroys the enemy after the enemy after he pours out the bulls destroys in the final battle at the end of the 14th year in armageddon he will establish everything he will raise the dead he will reward those right the those who are part of the first resurrection that will rule and reign with them for the millennial reign. He will raise those that were promised their millennial reign. Just like Daniel was told in the very last verse of Daniel chapter 12, lie in your plot until the last day. The Jews know that their resurrection is coming at the end, at the last day, because theirs is, to, is, to, is, um, uh, uh, is their promise, millennial reign, their heaven on earth. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The pre-trib and mid-trib is the kingdom of God. Water will flow out after that final battle and will renew and restore the land and the earth. And then he will what? Bring them back into the land and they will each receive their land and their promise and his bride comes. You see, he has more than one bride. He has his Gentile bride and he has his Jewish bride. One Leah, one Rachel. Brothers and sisters, I pray this has blessed you. I pray as it, it was as exciting for you as it was for me. Even, even in doing the video, 
I, I got more excited and I was able to find even more detail. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I know just little things that I caught along the way that I was able to add into my study that just, just lay it all out, that have it all defined for us right there. We know it can't be before the end of the seventh trump, the sixth trumpet, and we know it can't be after the 14th year. It cannot be after the millennial reign, which leaves one place where we've always said it was. And there it is. It is in the end of the seventh year of trumpets. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. Man, I'm so excited. I love this, man. I can do it day in and day out. Don't forget, if you can, please help us support the ministry here and abroad. Uh, I know they could really use it right now over in Uganda, trying to get more printouts done, uh, printing more books, getting buying more Bibles. We Everything is supplied for them there. Everything is paid for through the ministry and the generosity and kindness of all the brothers and sisters here. So with that, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. And we will see you very, very soon. Bye for now.